Father, today as we uh, look at your word, we want to, Lord, we want to see you. And God, as we read, we don't want to just read words or read a story or read of some account, but God, we want to we hear from you so that our lives would be different. God, we want you to come in and, and change us, mold us, and shape us. We don't want to just come to church because we're religious people and, and that's what we do, but Lord, we've come seeking you and we want to have you move in a mighty way. So I pray that you would move, remove any distractions, anything that, might, anything that might be going on that might be hindering us from hearing you and hindering us from receiving what you have and that we would be open to that and God, that you would have your way with this time. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, today we hit to me an interesting part of, of uh, the Gospels and the account of Jesus. Today we're going to see, to me, a totally different Jesus. One who seems so out of character from the way most people paint Jesus. And he's going to do, he's going to, listen, he's going to go to a place that is a little bit bizarre for him to go to. And then he's going to do something that is completely out of character. And you know what I love about that is it shows we can't put our God in a box. He doesn't fit in a box. He doesn't fit in a mold. And he doesn't always fit in the, even, even as Christians, even as Bible-believing and Bible-reading Christians, we can begin to form these things and, you know, and then we read and go, oh, that doesn't fit. And Jesus goes, I know. <laughs> and so as we do this, then also in the midst of all of this, we're going to learn about Great faith, and we're going to get a definition of what great faith is because I think oftentimes we think great faith is having faith in faith, and that makes it great. And for some reason, and I don't know why we get into that way, but that's what we do. But we're going to get a lesson along the way that I think is one of the most incredible lessons on faith and walking by faith. So verse 21 says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now remember, Jesus has been interacting with the Pharisees and, and doing that ministry. And now, listen, now Matthew tells us he departs from there. He departs from Galilee and he goes to Tyre and Inside and, and Mark tells us he does that to get away. Hey, for homework, you can read Mark chapter 7, kind of get a, a bigger picture of what's going on here. But Mark says he does this to get away, to get some rest. Remember, way back in chapter 14, he was going away to get rest, and he still hasn't gotten any rest. So here's what's kind of bizarre. He goes to a Gentile country. Does that kind of blow your mind when you think about it? Didn't he tell his disciples not to go to the Gentiles? And it's like, what are you doing here? Why would you do that? And I think, you know, I think if they asked him, he would say, because I want to go get some rest, that's why. And you would think, listen, you would think if you go to that area, the Gentiles have nothing to do with the Messiah. They don't know, you know, they shouldn't know what's going on. They should be oblivious to it. So you could go there, kind of chill out a bit, get some rest, get rejuvenated, and come back. So I believe that was the plan. I believe that's why Jesus went there. I don't think he went there just to blow our minds. I mean, part of it is to blow our minds, but he just wanted to go. So listen, he's going there to get some rest. And in verse 22, here's where it gets to start getting crazy. And behold, a woman of Canaan came uh, came from that region and cried out to him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. Really? So a Canaanite woman. Now remember the Canaanites are bad people all through scripture. And it, you know, and then uh, Mark calls her a Syrophoenician lady, which, which means she probably worshiped the goddess Astarte and, and was in that whole vein of things. And you know, from this, I'm gathering that her gods have not come through for her, haven't done what she expected them to do. So now this lady shows up and does it sort of blow your mind, the terminology she uses? She comes to Jesus and she calls him the son of David. That's a messianic term. Gentiles don't use that term. It shouldn't mean nothing to her. And here she's using that term. And I, for one, have to wonder, where did she get that? Where did she learn that? You kind of maybe think maybe Facebook was alive back then and she saw it someplace on Facebook. 
Where else, how did she get that terminology and to approach him that way? And then the fact that she's just approaching him. We have this lady who is desperate. And what's great is she's desperate for her child. Her child is demon possessed. And again, I may be reading into it, but I think she's exhausted all of the, you know, all of the, the Canaanite religious things and none of them worked. So, so she came to the only thing she could get a hold of. She's grasping for something and she's coming to Jesus desperate and she's crying out to him, have mercy on me. Something I love about this lady is she doesn't come demanding. You know, sometimes even as Christians, we get a little demanding of God. We do. And she's not, listen, she's not demanding. She's not coming as somebody who feels entitled to something. She's coming and saying, I need mercy. And I got to have mercy. And then she cries out, son of David. And listen, that had to, listen, I think that blew everybody's mind there. I think they're like walking along in my mind. They're walking along and this lady shows up and she, you know, says all this stuff. And I think the disciples are going, what just happened? But I want us to notice Jesus' reaction to her. Verse 23 says, but he answered her not a word. Now stop there for a moment. Think about this. You're desperate. You're hurting. And you go to the one individual you think can really help you, and you cry out to him, and you cry out to him, and you take big risks just by coming, and you use some terminology maybe you heard about, you thought was going to be the key, and you think you're there, you think you did right, and he does this. What would you do? Like, did I say that right? He's, he's not saying a word to her, nothing. Zip, nothing, not even, I don't hear you, nothing. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but doesn't it usually get uncomfortable when somebody just stares you down? Like you're going, just say something, man. I don't even care if you yell at me. Just say a word, you know? And he's not, listen, he's not answering her. It's like he's just like, I don't even think you exist, lady. Hmm. Think about your life and your walk with Jesus. That'd be tough to take. Nothing, silence, deafening silence. So the disciples, they're uncomfortable, I think. I think everybody's uncomfortable right now. I think she's uncomfortable. I think the disciples are uncomfortable. I even think maybe Jesus is uncomfortable. And he might be uncomfortable because of what she did. So listen. He doesn't say a word, so his disciples, they came up with a plan. I got to believe this was Peter's plan. <laughs> and his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. So that is implying that she didn't just say this once. She's, listen, she's being, she's being a little bit obnoxious. And so the disciples, now listen, I don't think they were saying, just get rid of her. Just get, get this lady out of here. I don't think that's what they were saying. I think what they were saying is, and I'll tell you why in a moment, I think what they're saying is Jesus, just do what she wants and let's move on. Just answer, answer her prayer, do what she asks you to do because they knew he could do it. Let's get it done and let's get on our way because this lady's driving us nuts. And then I can just still, still see Jesus. Maybe, maybe he's just walking along like this. You know, and, and that lady's there, and the disciples are over here. And it's just one of those situations where everybody's thinking, I don't even want to be in this situation. I don't want to be in this scene. I wish you would have wrote this different. So they had a great plan. Now, here's why I think they're telling him to, you know, answer her prayer and do what she wants. Look at verse 24. It says, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, that's why I think they're saying, just answer her prayer. And he's going, no, that's not my mission. That's not what I was sent for. You know, and sometimes I think it's hard for us, even in the 21st century, to realize Jesus came and he came for the house of Israel. We need to understand that. He came as the Messiah to the Jews. That's why he came. We just get in because the Jews rejected him. And we get grafted in. And listen, the church, you know, the church is a mystery, Paul says. So we need to understand that. So here's what Jesus tells, tells them. And I think in her hearing, Jesus says, hey, I didn't come for the Gentiles. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's why I'm here. In other words, I'm not going to answer her prayer. And I'm thinking, man, 
Jesus, she's standing right there. Right? I mean, hey, this woman, it would, it would, would, that, would that be discouraging to you? Would that be a time where you're just going, I'm giving up on this, man. I don't even want to, I don't, you know what? I thought Jesus was a God of love, compassion, concern. He's not showing any of that right now, is he? Sort of blows your mind, huh? Whenever I read this, I also think of those people who have this, you know, this beautiful picture of Jesus painted, and it's such a distorted picture because they only read parts or, or hear parts of, of the gospel or whatever that they like, and they don't read the whole thing. Listen, this is pretty intense. Like, Jesus is basically, bottom line, up to verse 24, he's blowing her off. And he didn't want to have anything to do with her. That's scary, isn't it? Then... It gets even better. So, verse 25, then she came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. Listen, man, I love this part. Listen, this lady came, and your translation may say fell down at his feet, but she worshiped him. Hey, if you ever want to see what true worship looks like, look at this lady. She came and worshiped him, not because of what she was going to get. She just got told, you're getting nothing. And she worshiped him because of who he is. And she fell at his feet. And then, and then my favorite prayer, it's much like Peter's prayer, right? Lord, help me. Again, I think we try to be too eloquent in our prayers. And we try and do this and we try and do that, especially if we're in a prayer meeting and other people are hearing us. We spend more time praying to the people around us than we do to God, if we're really honest. Because we want to make sure we sound okay. Pour out your heart to God. Lord, help me. I love, those three are power, those three words are powerful words. And she cries out, man, and falls at his feet. Now, something else I want us to notice. I think in verse 23, when we read that, when she came the first time, or I'm sorry, verse 22, when she came the first time, I think she had a formula for worship. Her formula for worship was, I got to call him son of David. I got to do these certain things, and that's how it's going to work. In verse 25, it's just all out, plain, simple, pure worship, Lord help me. You see, we get into these things about formulas and we, we kind of think that's supposed to work for me and that's supposed to do something for me. Hey, this lady, son of David, wasn't anything to her but words. Now she's being real. She kind of got stripped of all of that. And now she's being real and she cries out. And, and listen to me, I think verse 25 is like one of the most intense parts of this scene. So you got the disciples, they're trying to tell him what to do. Jesus says, no, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she's falling, man. This lady's at his feet, worshiping him, crying out, Lord, help me. And what does Jesus do? Oh, it gets worse. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Wow. Whoa. I mean, I read that and I, I, you know, I'm just like, seriously? This woman is, is in a worse position, I think, ever of her life. And she became so vulnerable. She put herself out there. She exposed herself. And Jesus just called her a dog? Now, it's interesting because you read and, and the, you know, the, the Greek experts say, oh, and even the New King James kind of implies that. It says little dogs. And they go, oh, you know, he wasn't calling her, you know, a big mangy gr cruddy dog. He called her a little dog. Oh, that makes it so much better. <laughs> hey, Chihuahua, right? I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, to me, you know, that doesn't fix anything. And I want us to think about something. Bottom line, he was letting her know that he knew she was a Gentile. Think if somebody used that kind of language today, talking about another ethnicity or another race. If this happened in our century with all of the cultural sensitivity that we have going on and all of this stuff going on, Jesus would have been labeled right there. Jesus would have been done. He would have been over with. He would have been taken out. Wow, you know, you read that and you're going, this is crazy. And then think of this lady. Now think of her position. This lady came because she loved her daughter. 
because she was concerned about her daughter, which any mother would be, but she seemed super concerned. She's enough to take and take risks and put herself out there and become extremely vulnerable. And she comes and does all of that. And look at the obstacles this lady has hit so far. Her, her obstacle now has to do with her race. And Jesus says, you're of the wrong race. I didn't come for you. I didn't come for that house. I came for the house of Israel. Her sex, ladies, hey, rabbis didn't talk to ladies. And she came out anyway. Obviously, the disciples are against her. Let's just get rid of her. Just brush her off. Just get her out of here. And it even seems like Jesus is not real fond of her. He's called her a dog. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's when I would quit. That's when I would give up. I mean, that's tough. That's some tough, man. That's some tough stuff to go through. And you know, it's interesting to me because in, in, you know, what we call the church today, one little incident happens in, in our walk or, you know, our fellowship with other people and we're all up in arms and we're gone and we're out of there and we're not talking to anybody and we're doing this. Man, hey, this lady, so, so listen, he just said, hey, he says, I'm not giving you the bread, man. And here's my favorite part. Look at verse 27. I mean, I love her prayer, Lord, help me. But verse 27, and she said, yes, Lord. Listen, just stop there. Here's what she says. I know, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's insane, isn't it? Why is he right? Because he's God. And she goes, I get that. That's fine. And then, how beautiful. She says, yet... Even the little dogs eat crumbs which fall from their master's table. Wow. Do you hear what this, here's what this lady's saying. All I want is a little tiny crumb. That's all I want. I don't need the whole pie. I don't need the whole meal. Just a crumb. All I need is a crumb. Does that blow your mind? Listen, man, she is not giving up, is she? She's tenacious, and she's hanging in there, and she says, just give me a crumb. All, just a, all I need is a crumb. That's all I need. You can give the rest of the food to the house of Israel. Just let a little bit fall my way. That is, a, that is a powerful, powerful lady and a powerful, powerful act of faith. And it's real faith because why? Because her faith is in Jesus, in an object. Listen, your faith can only be great if the object of your faith is great. If the object of your faith isn't great, your faith can't be great. You can have all the faith in the world in the wrong object, and it's not going to be great faith. So listen, she says, Jesus, all I want, all I want, just a crumb. Just give me a tiny crumb. And then Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, I kind of like that. Now listen, that isn't derogatory. That's more of, a, that's more of an expression of, 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 uh, of uh, 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 respect and et cetera. So I don't want you to think he went, oh, woman, you know. He went, it, again, it's a term of endearment, so this is a good term. He says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Wow. Then he turns around and he goes, man. Hey, remember when Peter was walking on the water and he started sinking? Remember what Jesus said? Why is your faith so little? I think right now Pete's feeling like a real dweeb. Why is your faith so little? Do you know that there's only two times that Jesus ever said anybody had great faith? And both of them are Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? We just read a few months ago about the centurion. And isn't it interesting? Both of them came for somebody else, not for themselves. Both of them approached Jesus and came to him on behalf of somebody else. And they're trying to bring somebody to Jesus, which tells me that we need to be bringing people to Jesus. But both of them, but the interesting thing with the centurion, Jesus didn't turn to the centurion and said, great is your faith. What did he do? He turned to his disciples and said, I've not seen such great faith. But here he turns to this lady and says, great is your faith. I think that lady went, yes, right? That great is your faith and then let it be as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Wow. What a great, what a great lesson for us. What a great encouragement for us. Although we kind of wade through some difficult stuff and some hard stuff, yet it is encouraging, and I hope it's encouraging in a couple ways. Number one, watching the lady and seeing her attitude, but also understanding, you know what? 
Jesus isn't this, you know, cookie cutter Jesus that everybody tries to make him out to be. And Jesus was real. And I'm not saying he made a mistake. I'm saying he did real stuff here. Now, why did he do all of that? Did he do all of that so we could say, oh, Jesus doesn't fit in a box? No, I think he did most of this to teach his disciples a lesson and let them begin to understand, you know what? You need to find people who have great faith and you need to work with those sort of people. And you need to not just brush people off and not just dismiss them. So I, I, listen, I believe, I believe it was a lesson for them. I also believe it was a lesson for the lady. Hey, lady, don't come pretentious calling me son of David. Get real. Get real, lady. I'm not the son of David to you. Hmm? So listen, and all of this goes down. And, and so, so then, verse 29, then Jesus departed from there and skirted the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain and sat down. So now he leaves there, he comes back. But according to Mark, he doesn't come back into Israel. He goes to the Decapolis. The Decapolis is the 10 cities on the other side. Listen, on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and, and they, were, they were mostly Gentile. I'm sure there was a few Jews, but mostly Gentiles. And these 10 cities even... Even, they even got their own governor. They were Roman province, but they got their own governor. And they, kind of, they kind of did some stuff on their own. And Jesus goes there. Now, I find that interesting. Listen, still, he's still staying out of Israel. Why? Because they pushed him away. The leadership of Israel doesn't want to have anything to do with him. So now, listen, he skirts and he goes over there. And it says, listen, man, he went there and sat down. Verse 30, then great multitudes came to him. Now, here's what I'm thinking. He went to go get rest, and he still hasn't rested. Right? That lady interrupted everything and kind of caused the scene. Now he's over here. He's sitting down. And multitudes show up, which is, you know, to me, thousands. They came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. And they, and they laid uh, them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Listen, man, I mean, Matthew puts this so simple and so does Mark. It's like no big deal. It's like all of these, all of these different infirmities, they're, they're just bringing this, this mass of humanity to Jesus. And he's just, okay, and he's just healing them. Now, isn't that just the opposite of what we just read about compassion? The lady shows up and there's like to me, you know, for a long time, there's zero compassion. Now here there's compassion just oozing out of him and he's healing them and he's healing every kind of, of disease that they bring and every kind of sickness. And then it says, so the multitude marveled in verse 31 when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified, listen, the God of Israel. These are Gentiles, and now they're glorifying the God of Israel. The people who worship the God of Israel have rejected him and everything he's doing. These people who have zero, really, light are glorifying the God of Israel. That blows my mind. Those who know, and here's the problem, man. Sometimes we study and we think we know, but we don't know what we think we know. And then we get into trouble. The Pharisees have rejected the king of kings. The people in the Decapolis who probably should have thrown him out, they haven't. The Canaanite lady, how much light do you think she had? I don't think she had much light. And she comes and worships him. And now these people are doing it. So check out verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want them to, uh, to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. So listen, man, Jesus calls his disciples to him and he says, hey, we, can, we got some guys here. Now I read ahead and there's 4,000 men, not counting women. And he says, we've got to feed these people. Now, here's an interesting thing. A lot of scholars think that Matthew got mixed up and that Matthew recorded one event twice, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And they, they say, you know, and he just kind of got lost with numbers and stuff. You need to remember something. Matthew is an accountant. Yeah. Accountants count beans, <laughs> right? He's not going to mess up numbers. He's not going to mess up, and he's not going to mess up, listen, he's not going to mess up, you know, facts and what's going on. Number one, number one, that tells me, you know, hey, you guys, you guys are, you're, you're picking on the wrong 
author here. Maybe if you picked on John, it would be okay, but not Matthew. Matthew's not going to do that. And then, for me, I just look across the page in chapter 16. In chapter 16, Jesus says, how many basketfuls did you pick up when I fed the 5,000? And how many basketfuls did you pick up when I fed the 4,000? So Jesus seemed to think he did it twice. So if Jesus did it twice, I'm with Jesus, right? I'm going to hang with him instead of the critics. So, you know, I don't think we need to go into other arguments, you know, the different numbers and different things. I'll bring up a couple things. But here's what I love. Think about this for a moment. For us, it was just a couple weeks ago when he fed the 5,000, right? For them, it was a few months ago. But Jesus fed the 5,000, right? We were all there. And they were all there. So he turns to his disciples, and one of the big differences in the 5,000, they were only there one day. These guys have been there three days, so they are hungry. You know, we made fun of, you know, I'm starving to death after two meals. But these guys, listen, these guys, three days. So Jesus says, man, hey, we need to take care of them. And then his disciples said to him in verse 33, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? You guys, what are you thinking? Here's something I think they're thinking. They don't think Jesus is a miracle machine like some people. They're not expecting him to do a miracle every time they turn around. Well, he should, he should know. He should know how to feed these 4,000. He fed 5,000. He can do that. And also, I think they're thinking, Jesus, I think they're kind of making a statement. Jesus, it's no easier for us to feed 4,000 people than it was for us to feed 5,000 people. Here's, you're asking us to do something impossible again. We can't do it. Hey, saints, even when God does something incredible in our lives, we need to still remain humble and understand it's not in our power to do certain things. They're not thinking, oh, yeah, we did this once. We can make food. No, they're going, we can't, we can't do it. I love that, man. We can't do it. There's no way. And then he said, in verse 34, Jesus said to them, how many lo-? It's kind of like this. Okay, guys, here we go. How many loaves you got? Remember last time they stole the kid's lunch. That's what I always think. Little guy had his lunch. Hey, this little guy's got some fish and bread. We'll steal it from him and feed everybody. Now they just go, hey, man, we have five loaves and some fish. Or seven loaves, I'm sorry. Seven loaves and a few fish. And once again, man, saints, bring Jesus what you have. He's not expecting you. Listen, all you got to do is bring him what's in your hands. And let him do the work. He's not, he's not expecting us to, to, you know, manufacture things. It's bring him what you have. So they go, this is what we have, Jesus. This is what we got to work with. And in my mind, I think they're thinking in the back of their mind. I think they're thinking, and we know what you're going to do, right? And he sort of does the same thing. So he commanded the multitude in verse 35. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. Now, here's a big difference, something I, I, I think that lets us know. This is months apart. In, the, in, in chapter 14 with the 5,000, do you remember he said, sit on the grass? Here he says, sit on the ground. Why? Because there ain't any grass left. Israel is much like southeast Arizona. I always get, get kind of tickled when people move here in July and August. And they go, man, it's green. You know, the rainy seasons come and everything's green and, and, and they move here and I think, are you in for a shocker, man? <laughs> right? Because they move here, it's so green and what, in a month, it's brown. We live here. I mean, I've lived here all my life, so I, I know what's going to happen. Well, Israel's a lot like that. So here's what this is telling me. First miracle of 5,000 was done in the springtime, and it was green, and he had them sit on the grass. This miracle is after that time, and they're sitting on the ground. Why? Because there's no grass left. So he has them sit on the ground. So just, just kind of a time frame thing we can gather from what we're reading. And then, and then verse 38, he took the seven loaves, and he fished, and he, and he gave thanks, and he broke them, and he gave them to his disciples, uh, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large basket, baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now, 
and it says that out of those uh, that eight were about 4,000 men besides women and children. So again, we get a much larger number of people, right, that we figure. But uh, once again, I want to point out, and I know I did before, but since it's repeated, I'm going to repeat this. I think it's important we understand that Jesus used his disciples to administer and to distribute the food. He could have very easily just made it appear in front of everybody, couldn't he? But he uses his disciples. Why? Because we're called to serve people. We're called to do that. And he's teaching them, hey, you're called to do this. You serve them. You take what I have. And this is what I feel my responsibility is as a pastor teacher. I take what God has given me and I take and I bring it and I serve it. And I serve it to others. And he's saying, just, just, you know, get it there. I've taught before. That's all, you know what? That's all we do as pastor teachers. We just take what God gives us and we just serve it to others. And I love John MacArthur said, you know, and as a good waiter, keep your fingers out of the mashed potatoes. You know, in other words, hey, don't put your fingerprints all over it. It's not you, it's God. And so he's saying, man, just take it to them and let's them be involved what he's doing. But then the difference here is they picked up seven. Uh, Last time they picked up 12, right? It's kind of one for each one. But last time, the word for baskets was like a small basket that you would put a lunch in. This word for baskets, it even says in the New King James, large baskets, this is the size they stuck Saul in. Remember when Saul was in Damascus and they had to let him down over the wall? It was a hamper size. So these guys are like, they've got these big old honking baskets of food now. Now that's incredible, right? And then they're carrying them away and I don't know if it took two for each basket and they let Jesus carry the seventh one by himself. I don't know. They had seven of them, and then 4,008, and then verse 39 says, and he sent away the multitude, got into a boat, and came to the region of Magdala. So now listen, now he gets into the boat, and he finally comes back into Israel. And now we're going to spend quite a bit of time wrapping up what's going on in Galilee, and we're going to head down to Jerusalem with him and, and go on that trip. Now, once again, man, I want us to think about, think about what we read. And how incredible this lady is. She's one of my Bible heroes. I don't know her name. So when I get to heaven, I'll say, hey, Syrophoenician lady, where are you? (laughs) You know, or (laughs) never mind, I was going to say something bad. (laughs) But isn't she incredible? Every time, every time I read this, I am blown away and I never get tired of reading it because there's so much in there and then the fact that Matthew decided to put together through the Holy Spirit this act of incompassion if you will with an act of tremendous compassion letting us know man once again we can't hey Jesus acted one way in one situation acted another way in another situation. I think one thing we learn is Jesus deals with people according to their heart. And the word of God deals with people according to their heart. You have a hard, stubborn, stiff heart, then you know what? God is gonna bust you. And God is gonna come at you through his word. You have a tender, broken, gentle heart. He's probably going to bring a lot of compassion your way. You're going to, you're going to love the Psalms, you know, and, and he kind of brings that kind of stuff. But the word of God ministers to our hearts. And Jesus here is showing he's ministering to the hearts of the individuals and letting those guys know, hey, here's what we're all about. And then one of the great things is Jesus ministered to Gentiles. He went outside of Israel and took the time to minister to Gentiles. So as we leave today, I want us to think about, number one, where are we at in our journey of faith? And maybe some of us feel like this lady. Maybe some of us feel like we've come to Jesus and he's like, silent, nothing. Maybe some of us feel like we've come to him and we've been brushed away by by maybe some leadership in the church. Maybe somebody didn't didn't give you the attention you thought you needed and they just kind of, hey, go away, get out of here. Don't Don't judge Jesus by the way people treat you. And maybe some of us, maybe we feel like we've just been put down by Jesus. Learn from the lady, man, do not give up. Do not walk away. Do not go away saying, well, I thought he was supposed to be a God of love, but he's not very much of a God of love. He just called me a dog. Hmm. 
grab a hold of him and tell him this, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. All I want is a crumb. The guys down in verses 32 through 36, they got a big old meal. All I want's a crumb. It's all I need. Let's stand up and pray. Lord, as we stand up and think about what we've read and think about what went on in this scene, two pretty contrasting ideas going on. And yet one God. And I pray, Lord, I pray for those of us, maybe this morning we're hurting and we're feeling the the pain of this lady. I pray that her demonstration to us would stick in our hearts and we would know that our God is a great God and that even in the very beginning when she first approached him, he knew exactly what he was gonna do. But she had to go through a process, the disciples had to go through a process and oftentimes in our lives, He's walking us through a process, maybe a process of purification, maybe a process of of correction, but he's walking us through a process. And God, don't ever let us be people who cut that off. And I pray, I pray that we would understand that worship isn't something that's kind of orchestrated by by, uh, uh, certain uh, labels and and certain things that worship is an issue of the heart falling before a great God. And we thank you that we do have a great God. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for just another couple moments. And you know what? If you are here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, you've never asked him to come into your life and change you, man, today's the day to do that. Today is a day that God has made specifically for you. He brought you here for that specific purpose. So if you want to change, all you have to do is call on his name. And you got to let him know that you know that you're a sinner. That's called confession. You don't have to tell him every sin. You just got to let him know you know you're a sinner. Jesus Christ came and died on a cross for our sins. Why? Because our sins separate us from God. They built a barrier between us and God. And Jesus came and died on the cross to take away that barrier and to restore that relationship. So he's offering you that this morning. And all you have to do is cry out to him. So if you want to do that, I'm going to say a prayer. You can say it with me. You can say it out loud. You can say it silently. As I've been talking about, it's not not volume that matters. What matters is your heart and the sincerity of your heart. If you're backslidden today and you just happen to come back to church and and kind of thinking about getting back uh, where you need to be, say this prayer with us. Come back to Jesus. Come home. Jesus, today I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And now I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you here today for your forgiveness. And now I'm asking you to come into my heart and change me. Come into my life and guide me. Today, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. If you said that,